The Fall of Hyperion, A Dream, by John Keats, read for LibriVox.org by Katie Riley, May 2010. The Fall of Hyperion, Canto One. Fanatics have their dreams, wherewith they weave a paradise for a sect. The savage too, from forth the loftiest fashion of his sleep, guesses at heaven. Pity these have not, traced upon vellum or wild Indian leaf, the shadows of melodious utterance. But bare of laurel they live, dream, and die, for poesy alone can tell her dreams, with the fine spell of words alone can save, imagination from the sable charm, and dumb enchantment. Who alive can say, Thou art no poet, mayest not tell thy dreams? since every man whose soul is not a clod hath visions and would speak if he had loved and been well nurtured in his mother tongue whether the dream now purpose to rehearse be poets or fanatics will be known when this warm scribe my hand is in the grave methought i stood where trees of every clime palm myrtle oak and sycamore and beech with plantain and spice blossoms made a screen in neighborhood of fountains by the noise soft showering in my ears and by the touch of scent not far from roses turning round i saw an arbor with a drooping roof of trellis vines and bells and larger blooms like floral censers swinging light in air before its wreathed doorway on a mound of moss was spread a feast of summer fruits which never seen seemed refuse of a meal by angel tasted or our mother eve for empty shells were scattered on the grass and grape stalks but half bare and remnants more sweet smelling whose pure kinds i could not know still was more plenty than the fabled horn thrice emptied could pour forth at banqueting for proserpine returned to her own fields where the white heifers low and appetite more yearning than on earth i ever felt growing within i ate deliciously and after not long thirsted for thereby stood a cool vessel of transparent juice sipped by the wandered bee which i took and pledging all the mortals of the world and all the dead whose names are in our lips drank that full draught is parent of my theme no asian poppy nor elixir fine of the soon fading jealous caliphate no poison gendered in close monkish cell to thin the scarlet conclave of old men could so have wrapped unwilling life away among the fragrant husks and berries crushed upon the grass i struggled hard against the domineering potion but in vain the cloudy swoon came on and down i sunk like a salinas on an antique vase how long I slumbered, tis a chance to guess. When sense of life returned, I started up, as if with wings. But the fair trees were gone. The mossy mound and arbor were no more. I looked around upon the carved sides of an old sanctuary with roof august, builded so high, it seemed, that filmed clouds might spread beneath, as o'er the stars of heaven. So old the place was, I remembered none, the like upon the earth, what I had seen, of grey cathedrals, buttressed walls, rent towers, the superannutations of sunk realms, or nature's rocks, toiled hard in waves and winds, seemed but the falture of decrepit things, to that eternal doomed monument. Upon the marble at my feet there lay, store of strange vessels and large draperies, which needs had been of dyed asbestos wove or in that place the moth could not corrupt so white the linen so in some distinct ran imageries from a sombre loom all in a mingled heap confused there lay robes golden tongs censer and chafing dish girdles and chains and holy jewelries turning from these with awe once more i raised my eyes to fathom the space every way the embossed roof the silent massy range of columns north and south 
ending in mist of nothing then to eastward where black gates were shut against the sunrise evermore then to the west i looked and saw far off an image huge of feature as a cloud at level of whose feet an altar slept to be approached on either side by steps and marble balustrade and patient travail to count with toil the innumerable degrees towards the altar sober paced i went repressing haste as too unholy there and coming nearer saw beside the shrine one ministering and there arose a flame when in mid-may the sickening east wind shifts sudden to the south the small warm rain melts out the frozen incense from all flowers and fills the air with so much pleasant health that even the dying man forgets his shroud even so that lofty sacrificial fire sending forth mayan incense spread around forgetfulness of everything but bliss and clouded all the altar with soft smoke from whose white fragrant curtains thus i heard language pronounced if thou canst not ascend these steps die on that marble where thou art thy flesh near cousin to the common dust will parch for lack of nutriment thy bones will wither in few years and vanish so that not the quickest eye could find a grain of what thou now art on that pavement cold the sands of thy short life are spent this hour and no hand in the universe can turn thy hour-glass if these gummed leaves be burnt ere thou canst mount up these immortal steps i heard i looked two senses both at once so fine so subtle felt the tyranny of that fierce threat and the hard task proposed prodigious seemed the toil the leaves were yet burning when suddenly a palsied chill struck from the paved level up my limbs and was ascending quick to put cold grasp upon those streams that pulsed beside the throat i shrieked and the sharp anguish of my shriek stung my own ears i strove hard to escape the numbness strove to gain the lowest step slow heavy deadly was my pace the cold grew stifling suffocating at the heart and when i clasped my hands i felt them not one minute before death my iced foot touched the lowest stair and as it touched life seemed to pour in at the toes i mounted up as once fair angels on a ladder flew from the green turf to heaven holy power cried i approaching near the horned shrine what am i that should so be saved from death what am i that another death come not to choke my utterance sacrilegious here then said the veiled shadow thou hast felt what tis to die and live again before thy fated hour that thou hast power to do so is thy own safety thou hast dated on thy doom hi prophetess said i purge off benign if so it please thee my mind's film none can usurp this height returned that shade but those to whom the miseries of the world are misery and will not let them rest all else who find a haven in the world where they may thoughtless sleep away their days if by a chance into this fane they come rot on the pavement where thou rottedest half are there not thousands in the world said i encouraged by the soothed voice of the shade who love their fellows even to the death who feel the giant agony of the world and more like slaves to poor humanity labour for mortal good i sure should see other men here but i am here alone those whom thou speakest of are no visionaries rejoined that voice they are no dreamers weak they seek no wonder but the human face no music but a happy noted voice they come not here they have no thought to come and thou art here for thou art less than they what benefit canst thou do or all thy tribe to the great world thou art a dreaming thing a fever of thyself think of the earth what bliss even in hope is there for thee what haven every creature hath its home 
every sole man hath days of joy and pain whether his labours be sublime or low the pain alone the joy alone distinct only the dreamer venoms all his days bearing more woe than all his sins deserve therefore that happiness be somewhat shared such things as thou art admitted oft into like gardens thou didst pass erewhile and suffered in these temples for that cause thou standest safe beneath the statue's knees that i am favoured for unworthiness by such propitious parley medicined in sickness not ignoble i rejoice i and could weep for love of such a ward so answered i continuing if it please majestic shadow tell me sure not all those melodies sung into the world's ear are useless sure a poet is a sage a humanist physician to all men that i am none i feel as vultures feel they are no birds when eagles are abroad what am i then thou spakest of my tribe what tribe the tall shade veiled in drooping white then spake so much more earnest that the breath moved the thin linen folds that drooping hung about a golden censer from the hands pendant art thou not of the dreamer tribe the poet and the dreamer are distinct diverse sheer opposite antipodes the one pours out a balm upon the world the other vexes it then shouted i spite of myself and with a pythia's spleen apollo fated o oh, far-flown apollo where is thy misty pestilence to creep into the dwellings through the door crannies of all mock lyrists large self-worshippers and careless hectorers in proud bad verse though i breathe death with them it will be life to see them sprawl before me into graves majestic shadow tell me where i am whose altar this for whom this incense curls what image this whose face i cannot see for the broad marble knees and who art thou of accent feminine so courteous then the tall shade in drooping linens veiled spoke out so much more earnest that her breath stirred the thin folds of gauze that drooping hung about a golden censer from her hand pendant and by her voice i knew she shed long treasured tears this temple sad and lone is all spared from the thunder of a war foughten long since by giant hierarchy against rebellion this old image here whose carved features wrinkled as he fell is saturn's i monita left supreme sole priestess of this desolation i had no words to answer for my tongue useless could find about his roofed home no syllable of a fit majesty to make rejoinder to monitor's mourn there was a silence while the altar's blaze was fainting for sweet food i looked thereon and on the paved floor where nigh were piled faggots of cinnamon and many heaps of other crisp spice wood then again i looked upon the altar and its horns whitened with ashes and its languorous flame and then upon the offerings again and so by turns till sad monita cried the sacrifice is done but not the less will i be kind to thee for thy good will my power which to me is still a curse shall be to thee a wonder for the scenes still swooning vivid through my globed brain with an electral changing misery thou shalt with those dull mortal eyes behold free from all pain if wonder pain thee not as near as an immortal's sphered words could to a mother soften were these last and yet i had a terror of her robes and chiefly of the veils that from her brow hung pale and curtained her in mysteries that made my heart too small to hold its blood this saw that goddess and with sacred hand parted the veils then i saw a wan face not pined by human sorrows but bright blanched by an immortal sickness which kills not it works a constant change which happy death can put no end to deathwards progressing to no death was that visage it had passed the lily and the snow 
and beyond these, I must not think now, though I saw that face. But for her eyes I should have fled away. They held me back, with a benignant light, soft mitigated by divinest lids, half-closed, and visionless entire they seemed, of all external things. They saw me not, but in blank splendor beamed like the mild moon, who comforts those she sees not, who knows not what eyes are upward cast. As I had found a grain of gold upon a mountain side, and twinged with avarice strained out my eyes, to search its sullen entrails rich with ore, so at the view of sad Monita's brow, I ache to see what things the hollow brain behind in wombed, what high tragedy in the dark secret chambers of her skull was acting that could give so dread a stress to her cold lips and with such a light her planetary eyes and touch her voice with such a sorrow shade of memory cried i with act adornant at her feet by all the gloom hung round thy fallen house by this last temple by the golden age by great apollo thy dear foster child and by thyself forlorn divinity the pale omega of a withered race let me behold according as thou saidst what in thy brain so ferments to and fro no sooner had this conjuration passed my devout lips than side by side we stood like a stunt bramble by a solemn pine deep in the shady sadness of a vale far sunken from the healthy breath of morn far from the fiery noon and eve's one star onward i looked beneath the gloomy boughs and saw what first i thought an image huge like to the image pedestalled so high in saturn's temple then monita's voice came brief upon my ear so saturn sat when he had lost his realms whereon there grew a power within me of enormous ken to see as a god sees and take the depth of things as nimbly as the outward eye can size and shape pervade the lofty theme at those few words hung vast before my mind with half unravelled web i set myself upon an eagle's watch that i might see and seeing ne'er forget no stir of life was in this shrouded veil not so much air as in the zoning of a summer's day robs not one light seed from the feathered grass but where the dead leaf fell there did it rest a stream went voiceless by still deadened more by reason of the fallen divinity spreading more shade the naiad mid her reeds pressed her cold finger closer to her lips along the margin sand large footmarks went no farther than to where old saturn's feet had rested and there slept how long asleep degraded cold upon the sodden ground his old right hand lay nerveless listless dead unsceptred and his realmless eyes were closed while his bowed head seemed listening to the earth his ancient mother for some comfort yet it seemed no force could wake him from his place but there came one who with a kindred hand touched his wide shoulders after bending low with reverence though to one who knew it not then came the grieved voice of nemesine and grieved i hearkened that divinity whom thou sawest step from yon forlornst wood and with slow pace approach our fallen king is thea softest natured of our brood i marked the goddess in fair statuary surpassing wan monita by the head and in her sorrows nearer woman's tears there was a listening fear in her regard as if calamity had but begun as if the vanward clouds of evil days had spent their malice and the sullen rear was with its stored thunder laboring up one hand she pressed upon the aching spot where beats the human heart as if just there though an immortal she felt cruel pain the other upon saturn's bended neck she laid and to the level of his hollow ear leaning with parted lips some word she spake in solemn tenor and deep organ tune some morning words 
which in our feeble tongue would come in this like accenting how frail to that large utterance of the early gods saturn look up and for what poor lost king i have no comfort for thee no not one i cannot cry wherefore thus sleepest thou for heaven is parted from thee and the earth knows thee not so afflicted for a god and ocean too with all its solemn noise has from thy sceptre passed and all the air is emptied of thine hoary majesty thy thunder capitious at the new command rumbles reluctant o'er our fallen house and thy sharp lightning in unpractised hands scorches and burns our once serene domain with such remorseless speed still come new woes that unbelief has not a space to breathe saturn sleep on me thoughtless why should i thus violate thy slumberous solitude why should i ope thy melancholy eyes saturn sleep on while at thy feet i weep as when upon a tranced summer night forests branch charmed by the earnest stars dream and so dream all night without a noise save from one gradual solitary gust swelling upon the silence dying off as if the ebbing air had but one wave so came these words and went the while in tears she pressed her fair large forehead to the earth just where her fallen hair might spread in curls a soft and silken mat for saturn's feet long long those two were postured motionless like sculpture built it up upon the grave of their own power a long awful time i looked upon them still they were the same the frozen god still bending to the earth and the sad goddess weeping at his feet monita silent without stay or prop but my own weak mortality i bore the load of this eternal quietude the unchanging gloom and the three fixed shapes ponderous upon my senses a whole moon for by my burning brain i measured sure her silver seasons shed it on the night and ever day by day methought i grew more gaunt and ghostly oftentimes i prayed intense that death would take me from the veil and all its burthens gasping with despair of change hour after hour i cursed myself until old saturn raised his faded eyes and looked around and saw his kingdom gone and all the gloom and sorrow of the place and that fair kneeling goddess at his feet as the moist scent of flowers and grass and leaves fills forest dells with a pervading air known to the woodland nostril so the words of saturn filled the mossy glooms around even to the hollows of time-eaten oaks and to the windings of the fox's hole with sad low tones while thus he spake and sent strange musings to the solitary pan moan brethren moan for we are swallowed up and buried from all godlike exercise of influence benign on planets pale and peaceful sway above man's harvesting and all those acts which deity supreme doth ease its heart of love in moan and wail moan brethren moan for lo the rebel spheres spin round the stars their ancient courses keep clouds still with shadowy moisture haunt the earth still suck their fill of light from sun and moon still buds the tree and still the sea-shores murmur there is no death in all the universe no smell of death there shall be death moan 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 sibylle moan for thy pernicious babes have changed a god into a shaking palsy moan brethren moan for i have no strength left weak as the reed weak feeble as my voice oh oh the pain the pain of feebleness moan moan for still i thaw or give me help throw down those imps and give me victory let me hear other groans and trumpets blown of triumph calm and hymns of festival from the gold peaks of heaven's high piled clouds voices of soft proclaim and silver stir of strings and hollow shells and let there be beautiful things made new for the surprise of the sky children 
So he feebly ceased, with such a poor and sickly-sounding pause, methought I heard some old man of the earth bewailing earthly laws, nor could my eyes and ears act with that pleasant unison of sense, which marries sweet sound with a grace of form, and dolorous accents from a tragic harp, with large-limbed visions, more I scrutinized. Still fixed he sat beneath the sable trees, whose arms spread straggling in wild serpent forms, with leaves all hushed, his awful presence there. Now all was silent. Gave a deadly lie, to what I erewhile heard only his lips, trembled amid the white curls of his beard. They told the truth, though, round the snowy locks, hung nobly, as upon the face of heaven, a midday fleece of clouds. Thea arose and stretched her white arm through the hollow dark, pointing some whither, whereat he too rose, like a vast giant, seen by men at sea, to grow pale from the waves at dull midnight. They melted from my sight into the woods, ere I could turn. Monita cried, These twain are speeding to the families of grief, where, roofed in by black rocks, they waste in pain, and darkness for no hope. And she spake on, as ye may read, who can unwearied pass, onward from the antechamber of the stream, where, even at the open doors a while, I must delay, and glean my memory of her high phrase, perhaps no further dare. Canto two. Mortal, that thou mayest understand aright, I humanize my sayings to thine ear, making comparisons of earthly things, or thou mightest better listen to the wind, whose language is to thee a barren noise, though it blows legend laden through the trees. In melancholy realms big tears are shed, more sorrow like to this, and such like woe, too huge for mortal tongue, or pen of scribe. The titans fierce, self-hid or prison-bound, groan for the old allegiance once more, listening in their doom for Saturn's voice. But one of our whole eagle brood still keeps his sovereignty and rule and majesty. Blazing Hyperion on his orbed fire, still sits, still snuffs the incense teeming up, from man to the sun's god, yet unsecure, for as upon the earth dire prodigies fright and perplex, so also shudders he, nor at dog's howl or gloom birds even screech, or the familiar visitings of one upon the first toll of his passing bell, but horrors, portioned to a giant nerve, make great Hyperion ache. His palace bright, bastioned with pyramids of glowing gold, and touched with shades of bronzed obelisks, glares a blood red through all the thousand courts, arches and domes and fiery galleries, and all its curtains of aurorian clouds, flush angrily, when he would taste the wreaths of incense breathed aloft from sacred hills. Instead of sweets, his ample palate takes, savour of poisonous brass and metal sick, wherefore, when harboured in the sleepy west, after the full completion of fair day, for rest divine upon exalted couch, and slumber in the arms of melody. He paces through the pleasant hours of ease, with strides colossal, on from hall to hall, while far within each aisle and deep recess his winged millions in close clusters stand, amazed and full of fear, like anxious men, who on a wide plain gather in sand troops, when earthquakes jar their battlements and towers. Even now, while Saturn, roused from icy trance, goes step for step with Thea from yon woods, Hyperion, leaving twilight in the rear, is sloping to the threshold of the west. Thither we tend. Now in clear light I stood, relieved from the dusk veil. Mnemosyne was sitting on a square-edged polished stone, that in its lucid depth reflected pure her priestess garments. My quick eyes ran on from stately nave to nave, from vault to vault, through bowers of fragrant and enwreathed light, and diamond-paved lustrous long arcades. Anon rushed by the bright Hyperion, his flaming robes streamed out beyond his heels, 
and gave a roar, as if of earthly fire, that scared away the meek ethereal hours, and made their dove-wings tremble. On he flared. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.